The Psychedelic Report. Psychedelic drugs have played their part in America's long, strange trip toward an understanding of mind-altering drugs. The Psychedelic News. Leading physicians, scientists, and experts share their wisdom about psychedelic medicines and healing. Fifty years ago, psychedelic drugs were at the center of America's counterculture. The brightest minds in psychedelic medicine. The Psychedelic Report. We use the ketamine-assisted psychotherapy model that happens to have psychedelic effects that were not predicted when the drug was first developed. From researchers to investors. I think the biggest mistake we've made as a culture is the war on drugs. To physicians, to shamans, and nonprofit pioneers. Psychedelic drugs. Recent research suggests some of them could have legitimate uses. The Psychedelic News. Bring you diverse perspectives from the front lines of this exciting movement. The Psychedelic Report. Report. The Psychedelic Report was brought to you by Apollo Neuroscience and produced by Future Medicine Media. Welcome to The Psychedelic Report, your single source of truth for the psychedelic news. I'm your host, Dr. Dave Rabin. I'm a neuroscientist and psychiatrist trained in ketamine-assisted psychotherapy as well as MDMA-assisted therapy. Today, we discuss the disappointing FDA decision to reject MDMA-assisted therapy for approval for treating PTSD on August 9, 2024. This was a very surprising decision from the FDA, given the preponderance of evidence to support MDMA-assisted therapy as the best available treatment for PTSD, and perhaps the most effective treatment ever developed for any mental illness since the NIMH, the National Institutes of Mental Health, was founded in 1949 to treat PTSD. We have seen endless challenges in this 40-year path of MDMA-assisted therapy to get from a poorly understood street drug all the way through to the FDA's desk, with substantial double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials demonstrating safety and effectiveness. This has been no small undertaking. And the results being so good, akin to the discovery of antibiotics to treat infections by Alexander Fleming in the early 20th century, make the FDA's denial even more bizarre. As a result, the FDA decision on August 9th has drawn quite a bit of criticism from experts in the psychedelic space, as well as clinicians and researchers, leading the charge to address the unruly public health epidemic of mental illness. Rachel Neuer describes this in her August 13th article in Scientific American, entitled, FDA's Rejection of MDMA Psychotherapy for Trauma Draws Criticism from Psychedelic Experts, which we highly recommend you check out and we've linked it here for you in the show notes. Since August 9th, there has been a lot of open discussion about what this decision by the FDA means and what was motivating it, because it certainly wasn't based in scientific evidence from what this doctor can tell. This left a lot of open questions for us to answer, like, what is the outcome of this decision? What are the next steps and how long is it going to take MDMA therapy to get to the people who need it most? the tens of millions of Americans suffering from PTSD who are at the highest risk of suicide. Following the August 9th FDA decision, Breaking Points hosted a conversation between John Lubecki and David Nichols, formerly of Symposia, about what was motivating the FDA decision. David Nichols, representing himself and in part Symposia as a former leading member, was directly involved in this construction of the false narrative that communicated fabricated safety concerns not based in evidence or reality about the MAPS MDMA trials to the FDA. At the end of this conversation, he calls out Symposia for conducting ethical violations and cited this as the reason why he defected from the organization. Nichols was not specific about what those ethical violations at Symposia were, but we can only guess given what they've been falsifying in the reports to the FDA about the MAPS trials. This is a very important moment to understand. In terms of the unprecedented nature of what MDMA-assisted therapy has had to go through to get to the FDA's desk, and the disruption caused by the falsification of information by symposia to the FDA, which was cited by ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, who was also manipulated by false information provided by Nichols and the Symposia team. It is now very clear from the public comments from folks and leadership at Symposia 
about how happy they were when they were able to prevent MDMA-assisted therapy from becoming available and legal as a treatment. The symposia team has also communicated publicly how excited they are that the FDA, an objective government organization that is responsible for protecting Americans, was able to be manipulated by their tactics to act against the best interests of Americans and act in their own best interests to protect what they perceived as risk to them, the FDA, if they approved MDMA-assisted therapy. To this doctor's knowledge, this situation of a radical extremist outside group like Symposia, with no experienced doctors or researchers on their staff, preventing a safe and effective treatment as proven by rigorous double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trials from being approved and made available to millions of patients in need, has never happened before and sets a frightening precedent for the future of healthcare in America. If a radical extremist group with no medical expertise can prevent a treatment as incredible and revolutionary as MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD from getting FDA approval, what will stop similar organizations from doing the same for cancer treatments, autoimmune disorder treatments, diabetes, you name it? I had a lot of questions that I wanted to have answered about what is actually going on. So I brought back John Lubecki. John Lubecki is a retired Army sergeant and veteran and former participant in the MAPS MDMA-assisted therapy trials. John is one of many real-life examples of the truly life-saving benefits of MDMA-assisted therapy delivered via the MAPS protocol. As a 12-year retiree of the U.S. Armed Forces, John worked with MAPS in the past to help facilitate education of the federal government and military decision makers on MDMA assisted therapy and why this is such an important treatment that is game changing for Americans. Currently, John spends much of his time providing public service to those in war torn areas in the Ukraine. John, thank you so much for joining us. It's always such a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, it's great for you to have me back on. There's been a lot that's been going on the past few weeks, uh, and hopefully we're going to have a great discussion. Oh, yeah, we always do. And I'm glad to have you back. You have expertise in this area and familiarity beyond most people I know, just given where and how you've worked in the space um, as a veteran and having worked closely with government on MDMA moving forward and education about this important clinical tool for PTSD. And on August 9th, as most people now know, the FDA declined approval clearance for MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD, which was a real surprise to most of us uh, in the space who are clinicians and scientists and researchers, and also a surprise, I think, to a lot of veterans and people who were seeing this as one of the best opportunities for treatment that we've had uh, since the founding of the NIMH in 1949 to treat uh, shell shock now known as PTSD. So could we start by you just giving us a little bit of an understanding of what happened on August 9th and the impact of that vote so far? So I, I do want to clear some things up. They did not say, no, this is over, go home, pack your bags. They are not requiring new phase one or phase two trials. We actually, until Lycos Therapeutics, which is currently either already has or in the very near future, we'll be requesting a meeting with the FDA for clarification and reconsideration. Now, part of that meeting is they get a big letter, but not everything's in the letter. And so the meeting will allow Lycos to sit down, ask questions, get very specific on things. But what the FDA said is we require more research, which is what the answer, frankly, has been for the past 20 years. Every second of research gets us closer to the end goal. This is not over, not by a long shot. The, the momentum is building. And as I've been saying, and I believe I, I said this after the adcom when we talked, this will be approved one day. And, and this is where I want to take a minute. This was devastating, not just to the veteran community. This was devastating to everyone who saw this as a ray of hope. You know, I try to be as clear as I can while, yes, I have been cured of PTSD and can very much de demonstrate that this doesn't work for everyone. There are people that, you know, even in the Lycos data, 30% of people did not go into remission, but it's a ray of hope because 70% did. And, and so it wasn't just veterans. 
it was sexual assault survivors, domestic violence survivors. You know, it was the 12 year old kid who ha who has PTSD because they live in an abusive household and one of their parents suffers from addiction who's hoping that when they turn 18, they can make the nightmares go away. And this is why I think it's critically important for everyone to realize this isn't the end of the road. There is always hope this will be approved. And it really sucks that the people who suffer from PTSD are delayed yet again. But I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to continue to fight until, you know, psychedelic assisted therapy is avail approved by the FDA and available in the VA through health insurance, through Medicaid, through Medicare, through all the ways we pay for health coverage, and that there's programs for people who don't have health insurance. Because that's the future I work towards. Absolutely. Same. And I appreciate you starting with that because I think that's really important for people to understand is that this isn't over uh, and that the results are so significant from MDMA-assisted therapy that this will get approved eventually. However, all that being said, we're talking about what kind of delay here. You know, what is, from what you know, what is the FDA asking of Lycos currently from what we know? And what do we think the delay is going to be in terms of when people actually get access to this treatment? FDA has said they want another phase three trial. Now, one of the questions that I don't think is currently known is what trial size that that would require that they are looking for. Uh, as in number of participants, what specific data that was missing from the first two needs to be collected, and also, frankly, how many phase three trials. So if you remember the, quote, phase three trial was actually a phase three trial and a confirmatory trial. Now, the question is, do they want one confirmatory trial with a thousand participants? Do they want two with five participants each because it's this tiny niche thing? These are some questions that we, frankly, don't know the answer to yet. I do know, as most people saw, both Lycos and MAPS had a major downsizing to conserve funds. They also brought in, I apologize, uh, I'm not sure his title, it was like chief medical officer or something like that to, to help figure out a way forward. Now, one of the things on the reconsideration, I mean, the reconsideration can frankly be anything. FDA could completely reverse their decision. Uh, FDA could say, okay, we don't need a full clinical phase three trial. We need more data. We'd like you to take the data you have, add in these parameters or weight this differently. Or it could be something like sending out surveys to phase three participants to fill out, to gather more data on, on certain things. And then also what things can be pushed off post-approval. You know, one of the things like how long do you have to stay until you can drive a car has not been answered. That's something that can easily be done in post approval by having people spend the night gathering the data, coming up with an answer and then implementing. But there, there's still a lot of open questions. Um, there's also been some very recent developments since uh, the decision, specifically um, the entity that was attacking MDMA assisted therapy and Lycos, it has been reported on the record that two members left over a year ago due to ethical violations at symposia that have yet to be answered for. We have no idea whether it's financial or sexual or somebody sharpened the pencils wrong. But the longer that everybody remains silent on this raises a lot of questions, especially considering ICER had symposia on their advisory committee and why ICER would want a, a writing professor on an advisory committee on MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is completely beyond me. But I think ICER and Symposia Business Insider, some of the other people who had a willful and biased yellow journalism attack against this have a lot of answers that they need to give or frankly, they shouldn't be listened to. You're listening to The Psychedelic Report. So I just want to fill in the gap here of what we're talking about, which is that from what we can tell, and anybody who's interested in this more in the deep dive can listen to the past three or four episodes of The Psychedelic Report, including one of our episodes with John, 
Uh, but ultimately, what we're talking about here is something that's unprecedented in the field of clinical research and drug development uh, with the FDA, which is that, from my understanding, for the first time in the history of the FDA, we are seeing a radical anti-capitalist organization known as Symposia, with a P, that has falsified information and put it into letters that they have written directly to the FDA and the FDA Advisory Committee in an effort to prevent the approval and clearance of MDMA-assisted therapy by the FDA. And this is fascinating for a lot of reasons and also very detrimental and destructive to all the work that's been done to try to move this therapy along because ultimately the results from the clinical trials are so robust and so significant and profound that we're seeing basically a repair process start to take place for a lot of people with PTSD and chronic PTSD that we've never seen before in the history of psychiatry. The precedent that the FDA is now setting for psychedelic assisted therapies to be approved is unreasonably high, given the fact that- I actually think that potentially show, showing the alt-left and, and, and the radical anti-capitalists, Marxists, whatever you want to call them, a pathway to block medications that people desperately need to live will be replicated, not just in the psychedelic space. I think that attack had more to do with if it's FDA approved, who would be treated and their belief that those people should not be treated. Those people being veterans. Yes. Yeah. Veterans, first responders, anybody who does not politically agree with them, you know, Jewish hostages, you name it. Anybody that the alt left dislikes or views as an oppressor doesn't deserve the right to heal from MDMA therapy or, or anything. But I, but I also think that that showing I mean, look, the, these are the people who set up tent cities and, and these are people who are riding at the DNC once shown a pathway to affl inflict damage. We will see this over and over again with lots of medications because, you know, as Nishé stated, you know, in a podcast with Symposia, that mental illness is a symptom of capitalism. And if you heal mental illness, then there's no reason to overthrow capitalism. Well, diabetes is, frankly, <laughs> a symptom of capitalism. So does that mean we should now ban insulin? I mean, the same argument equally applies. And the crazy part is, all of the people have openly stated they are non-prohibitionist that they you you know in in the debate between me and mr nichols he openly stated that, that he frequently uses psychedelics so it's not about safety and efficacy they openly stated but their argument is this will cause sexual assault and this will cause suicide as if that's and, not happening more already in the underground and unregulated environments and that's the issue. Look, if this was the Family Research Council or evangelicals who are like, drugs are bad, okay? And their argument was, this is dangerous. This is why we should ramp up enforcement and put people in jail, etc. You know, the drug war mantra. That would make logical sense. But coming at the FDA and scaring the FDA, because the FDA, if they say yes and something goes wrong, they get in trouble. If they say no... The people who bear the consequences aren't their friends. Suppose he is not going to bear any real consequence for this. The FDA isn't. But I guarantee you I'm going to be going to more funerals because of it. And that's kind of the issue. You know, the VA, I've had my issues with them. They've actually been really good recently. Uh, shout out to Dr. Elman Hall again, uh, Undersecretary for Health, for taking this seriously. But a lot of the problems at the VA kind of boil down to it's easier to do nothing than to do the right thing. And that's how a lot of times paperwork doesn't get done right and et cetera. And this is the hazard of any bureaucratic organization, not just the VA, but it also happens at FDA. And for the FDA, it was politically easier to say, no, we want more research than knowing what is going to happen if they don't. Because they're not going to get blamed if suicide rates stay the same. They're not going to get blamed, you know, but if Ozempic is used incorrectly, they are going to get blamed for approving it. Right. And, and I think part of the big issue is Symposia used a fear of sexual assault and increased suicide to spook the FDA, knowing that 
500 people have gone through trials. They're talking about one person and they don't talk about the rampant sexual abuse. Look, if you're getting your MDMA and it's not from Lycos or, or like the DEA, there is a not zero chance it has fentanyl in it. Right. Or something. Or something. And this, this is the issue. And all the people who demand that veterans not have access to this will go use MDMA because the law doesn't affect them because they just ignore it. But people like police officers, firefighters, truck drivers, you know, members of the military, veterans, others, most people won't be able to afford this if it's not FDA approved. But that's the whole point. This goes all the way back to the 60s. The counterculture anti-war left found psychedelics and, and, and thought they were fun. This is their thing. Well, here's the funny part. Republicans have, and conservatives have always done psychedelics. They just don't make it their whole life. Yep, you said it. And I think, you know, it can't be ignored, the precedent, like the precedent that's being set right now with, you know, what the FDA is communicating to our society, to America, can't be swept under the rug. Like we we need to talk about this, right? And And you bring up a key point, which is, if this was allowed to happen now, where an outside organization that is providing information with no evidence to the FDA that is supposed to be objective in every right and looking out for patients, uh, not just looking out for themselves, but looking as an organization of the federal government, but looking out for their for the patients in the community of Americans as public servants that they serve, technically speaking, you know, that they can be influenced by a group of non-doctors and non-researchers that call themselves the psychedelic watchdog organization could literally be replaced with anything watchdog organization and influence any government organization that's supposed to be looking out for us and for our communities. And that's why we pay our taxes, right? They you know, put, the FDA put their own personal reputation. They protected that rather than protecting American citizens. And I don't think you can look at it any other way. Right. Because the FDA should have asked the very questions we've talked about here. OK, what happens if we don't? Because otherwise, the system is inherently corrupted by people who want to use these drugs, who one of their motivating factors. Let's be honest. All right. Rick Doblin, love him to death. But you know what? What's his FDA dissertation? How to legalize drugs through the FDA. You'd think the FDA probably read that. Yeah. And a lot of other people did. And there's a lot of people who realized, wait, this isn't going to be like ketamine. This isn't going to be like other prescription drugs where I can just go to a doctor and get a prescription for 30 pills and get it filled at CVS or Walgreens or wherever. This is going to be highly controlled. And people got mad. They were like, but that wasn't the point. It was to legalize drugs through the FDA, not to actually heal people. And so they get mad and they threw a temper tantrum. The thing is, it's easy to throw a temper tantrum. Most of the left, you know, the, the, the far alt left, their demands, they don't face the consequences of any of what they demand. Right. It's a lot. It's always a lot easier to tear, tear stuff down than it is to rebuild it again. Right. Like something literally that took 40 years to get through to the FDA desk was torn down in three months, six months. And I've, I've had my personal yeah. reputation attacked by symposia. I've had my family's reputation attacked by symposia and you know what i'll be honest my ex-wife and my kid have nothing to do with my work but they have both been attacked why because it was about you know honestly me being a good spokesman and me i'm willing to put my reputation on the line to get this done they thought that if they attacked me i would run well where was i last time we talked i tend not to run away yeah, the last time we did an interview, I was really impressed. You were in the Ukraine providing service to the community there, which is clearly a sign that you have done a lot of self-work to be able to put yourself back in those environments. Well, and I'll tell you, after we spoke, uh, I went down to the lines, and uh, hopefully we have time for this, because this is actually a really interesting and good story. And I do a lot of support, supporting stabilization points so they can get equipment that they need to be able to, to help people. Like, I'm not a surgeon. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. I'm not an MD. I'm not even a medic. I do have some medical training for the military. And so I went down there with uh, my partner, Anna, 
who is the field director for Frontline Medics. Shout out to them, frontlinemedics.org. It was originally just to go check out and meet like the battalion doctor and, and check the place out and see if I wanted to help support it. Casualties start coming in. Spent about four or five days there. I will tell you, I saw more blood, more dead bodies, more artillery impacts in that period of time than I did the whole time I was in Iraq. Wow. And I came back on July 10th for the press conference at the Capitol. Actually got off the plane and went straight to the press conference because I found out on my trip home that I was exposed to chemical weapons while I was down there. So I did the press conference and then I went to Walter Reed to get checked out. I'm fine. It was low level. It was secondary exposure, but I still don't have nightmares either about either out there or, or Iraq. And it's funny because one of the nights I woke up cause I'm an old guy and I had to get up and pee and uh, I'm walking out of the, the, the hooch and I walked past another Iraq veteran. He was an Aussie and served in Iraq and he was shaking. I woke up laughing cause I had a funny ass dream and there was some shelling off in the distance and stuff. So I go, I take care of business, and I go back to sleep. And I talk to him in the morning. I'm like, how'd you sleep? He's like, like shit, because of all the shelling. I slept like a baby and had a hilarious dream. Wow. So I'm not saying that if you just go do MDMA, that'll happen to everybody. But I shouldn't be alive, so I live my life to prove that others can. If I can get fixed, so can anybody else. Yeah. You having pleasant dreams in that kind of environment is very different than the dreams you might have had in the past. Well, especially I would have those dreams in a completely safe and peaceful environment. And I'd still wake up with nightmares thinking I was in a combat zone. Like if I get awoken over there, startled because something went boom. Okay, it went boom and you were startled awake. That's different than being startled awake because something went boom and you're sitting in Charleston, South Carolina on a lake. And that is the kind of stuff that symposia poses. This is why people like Jules Evans and, and others are now saying, well, the data doesn't show suicide was reduced. How about you ask the 500 people who went through MDMA assisted therapy? How many of them believe they're alive today? Because I'm an N of one and I get that. I would be dead by suicide if I had not gone through MDMA assisted therapy, point blank. And I know I'm not the only one. I'm just frankly one of the few who's willing to come on a podcast and talk about it. You're listening to The Psychedelic Report. You know, getting back to what we, you were talking about earlier, you know, with symposia and the, and the precedent that's being set here for manipulation of a federal organization, the FDA, that's supposed to be looking out for all of our best interests, which is alarming in and of itself and cannot happen again. This is going to be appealed by maps like us with the FDA, we're going to see what happens. Um, but ultimately, there is, you know, some interesting information that's come to light since, which is you had a conversation, a uh, very pointed conversation on Breaking Point, I believe, with uh, David Nichols, Breaking Points. who used to be with David Nichols, who used to be a leader at Symposia and resigned, I think, a year ago. Can you summarize a little bit of that conversation for us and what was brought to light? Because I found it very interesting. Um, I'm assuming you're referring to the statement at towards the end. And and I will say uh, it was expertly moderated by by Ryan Grimm, who he, he wrote a book with, with a drug dealer. He worked for MPP. It's not like he's an opponent of any of this. Uh, he probably supports decrim. We haven't exactly talked about that. But just to say this, was, if there was any bias, it was probably on, you know, in the drug war. So uh, Mr. Nichols openly stated Weirdly enough, completely unprompted, in the middle of nothing, just kind of blurted out that uh, he had left Symposia in, he said, over a year ago. I know Lily, who he also works with, left in, I believe, April of 2023. Nichols left after that due to uh, ethical violations at Symposia that were reported and that management, refused the, the leaders of Symposia, refused to look into or even investigate. Which leads me to believe that this was something more than somebody sharpened the pencils wrong or posted an offensive meme. 
But again, I don't know. Nobody knows because Symposia hasn't said anything as vocal as they are. I mean, Sasha Cisco, I think, deleted his Twitter account. You know, I, I can't monitor Nache or Brian because they have me blocked because I asked them for evidence. But yeah, so there's severe, credible allegations of misconduct at Symposia that no one knows what it's about. It could be financial. It could, you know, like I said, it could be covering up a sexual assault. It could be you know, inappropriate conduct with with participants that they've been interviewing. We honestly don't know what it is. And I think they should come forward. I also think they should come forward and clearly state all their funding, specifically if they're being funded by any pharmaceutical companies, SSRI manufacturers, anyone in the psilocybin space, Ibogaine space, any other competing products, because you're actually required to do so uh, when you testify before the FDA. And that was not done. Um, I mean, at the very least, Brian Pace, it's well known. He's a professor at OSU teaching about psilocybin and mushrooms and things like that. That should have been disclosed. I mean, but they have never said where any funding comes from. And given the meteoric rise, it looks like they had a PR firm working for them. And I'd like to know who was paying them. Yeah, me too. I think a lot of people would like to know. I'm just demanding what they have demanded of, of, exactly. of White Ghost and of me. Yeah, what you're asking is not unreasonable, right? And the the fact that they deny it, the evidence for their claims and the evidence for, um, you know, what they're stating is clear indicator that something strange is afoot. This is a really important philosophical understanding for people to take away from this, which is that this is a very clear case of moral relativism. And we see this all the time where there is an organization or a person who talks about ethics all the time and talks about how important it is for everybody to have high integrity and to be moral and to always be considerate of everyone and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the narrative that they put out is always very focused on morality and ethics. And then when you look at their actions, their actions are to the exact contrary or opposite. I'll be honest. I don't view this as moral relativism. I view it simply as projection. Given, given the lack of facts and, and the fact that they just kind of randomly make things up about me and my kid, it, it's funny. It's projection. They accuse others of what they themselves do. Moral relativism is, hey, I can kill a thousand people because you killed a thousand of my people. I think this is far more of, of just projection because show me what, what they accuse people of and I can show you what they've done. Right. And, and you're exactly right. I would argue that it's both. You know, on one hand, the moral relativistic issue here is that they believe because of their political stance that cert they can decide who deserves a right to heal and who doesn't and what's right and wrong. And so then they act on that. So that's the moral relativistic perspective. But you're exactly right. They are engaging in unethical behavior and slander uh, and, you know, falsification of information and probably other things, which is the, which are the reasons why David Nichols and one of their other folks left. And they're talking about how great and ethical and morally superior they are. Right. And so this is this is a clear red flag for anybody who's listening. When you hear the, this kind of talk, you should ask yourself the question, is this what this person is saying, saying it for a reason? Because a lot of people will try to overly justify their own moral superiority and ethical superiority to make up for the fact that they are not actually being ethical themselves. Exactly. You know, it, it, it gets interesting because as a participant, as someone who's gone through this, since day one, I have said, regardless of what you've done, you should have access to heal. I believe that people who are formerly incarcerated should, should absolutely have this and it would reduce recidivism and, and, and a whole lump, bunch of problems. And I don't care what crime they committed. If the government has decided they should be released, then they're released. And the only reason I don't believe in doing it while incarcerated is it causes ethical problems with consent. Right. But I have never once said this person shouldn't be allowed to heal because of any reason. I believe everybody has the right to the opportunity to heal, period. Whether that's with MDMA, psilocybin, ibogaine. SSRIs, going to church, yoga, I don't care. But denying people the ability to heal because of your political beliefs is abhorrent. 
it's just like the Vietnam generals who killed as many as they could because those people didn't agree with you, their politics. Right. The Soviets killed a lot of people because they didn't agree with their politics. And this is what scares me. This is why I call the, these far left Marxists the alt left. They want to destroy this country just as much as the alt right. And they believe that by controlling a medicine that cures mental illness, they can force people to adopt their ideology. Because here, here's something. I, I believe that, that treatment should be very patient centric. And what I mean by that is I entirely understand why a person of color may want a, a person of color as a therapist. They, they have a similar lived experience. They can understand more in ways that I, frankly, as a white dude, cannot understand. I understand why somebody who's LGBT may want somebody from that community to be their therapist. As I also understand that a veteran may not want somebody who's Muslim and dresses in traditional Muslim garb or somebody, a straight person, or even an LGBT person who was raped by a man to have to do group therapy and accept LGBT and all of this when those are their triggers. No, 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 you have to accept these political beliefs to get treated rather than saying, what does the patient need to get better? Exactly. Never once had an anesthesiologist ask me my political beliefs before they put me under for surgery. Right. And that's a key point that you really hit on, which is that everyone deserves the right to heal. This is the entire premise of the history of medicine. And this is the the philosophy of the Board of Medicine, our, you know, our nonprofit educational organization. And if you go back in history, you know, and look at Hippocrates, Maimonides, the two forefathers of Western medicine, and into ancient tribal and Eastern medicine cultures, they all agree on the same core basic principles, which is that regardless of your political beliefs, regardless of who you are, regardless of what you've done, regardless of the crimes you committed, you deserve the right to heal. And if you need to be prosecuted for your crimes, you can be prosecuted after that, if it's an, especially if it's an emergency situation that requires emergency healing, right? We don't deny people emergency care. It's, you know, there are lots of rules against that. So if I deny the enemy medical attention, even if they were just shooting at me, it's a war crime. Right. So why isn't it a war crime what Symposia did? Right. It wasn't in the context of war, but it certainly is denying care. But isn't it? If we're talking <laughs> about veterans healing from PTSD, if I deny my opponent medical treatment that is desperately need, needed and they die, that's a war crime. If you are injured in war and you are prevented from healing, that is still a war connected as a war crime. Yeah, it's, it's just on civilian soil. Like no when different. I was in Iraq, no I, I didn't ask if people were insurgents before I g gave medical attention. If I come across a wounded Russian soldier, I'm going to treat them. I go feed rush villages that are loyal to the Russians in the Donbass, where I have to take my American flag off and hope they don't call in artillery. But they deserve a right to eat. Yeah. They deserve a right to have access to doctors that, that we bring with us. And, you know, it's funny. It's the military that taught me that, which is who they hate. And I think a lot of it has to do with they want to denigrate the military and the, the service of millions of people because they view what we do and they know they don't have the courage to do it. So it boils down to they hate us because they ain't us. I love the way you put that. And I love the use of humor because it's one of our most important coping strategies as human beings. But, but what you're saying is so important and it's so gr good to hear this from you and, re and refreshing at the same time because it's the most important takeaway from any conversation when we're face to face with human beings, which is really remembering always that we're all human first and we all have the same core wants, needs and desires uh, for survival and thriving as human beings on this earth. Despite all of the rest of the perceived differences between us, we're all human first, always, from the moment we're born to the moment we die. And we have certain inalienable rights that are critical to preserve the sanctity of humanity, not just for ourselves, but for our entire community to be able to continue to exist together, you know, and survive on this earth. So I really appreciate you uh, bringing it back to that and, you know, what we really need to remember as we move forward through these challenges that we're facing in the 
mental health space and the you know PTSD community in particular around psychedelic therapy getting over the line. So I just wanted to thank you again for taking the time to join me today. I really appreciate our conversations. And uh, is there anything you want to leave folks with before we wrap? Uh, just honestly, what I started with. It's not over till it's over. This is going to be approved at some point. I'm not saying it's going to be next week or next month. As a matter of fact, it won't be. It could be years. But when it is finally approved, I will gladly pop the cork on some champagne. And I hope everybody who's listening to this and everyone who's alive today is around to see it. Agreed. Thanks, John. Thanks for listening to The Psychedelic Report. Visit us at thepsychedelicreport.com. This show is recorded weekly on Clubhouse with a live audience. The Psychedelic Report was brought to you by Apollo Neuroscience and produced by Future Medicine Media. While I am a doctor, I'm not your doctor. So please don't take anything you hear on The Psychedelic Report as personal medical advice because we don't know you. If you have questions about anything you hear on this show, please consult with your doctor.